a century, fans have followed the victories and defeats of the Nebraska Cornhuskers. Yet for many, the origins of the University of Nebraska football team were a mystery. And although it may seem hard to believe, at one time, college football was not a part of life for the people living in the state of Nebraska. This was back when Nebraska's early settlers endured hardship, primitive living conditions, and racial strife. And the state university had just opened its doors. This is the untold story of the first decade of Nebraska football. In the early 1860s, the land that is now Nebraska was still part of the untamed West, populated by a few brave settlers strong enough to endure the harsh weather and primitive conditions. Life on the Great Plains was not for the timid or weak. What people in the East knew about Nebraska is that it was the frontier. It was part of the Wild West. Homesteading brought an incredible amount of attention to the state, and a lot of people who were having trouble making it wherever they were for whatever reason saw this as a, an opportunity to start over, to make something of their lives, and came out here with a tremendous amount of optimism, and I think that optimism stuck around and became sort of characteristic. It was a frontier uh, place. The institutions were just getting started. The University of Nebraska, you know, was founded in 1869. So things were new. Two years after officially becoming a state, the Nebraska government accepted federal land and the University of Nebraska was created in Lincoln. The creation of this new university allowed the sons and daughters of the rugged pioneers to become the first college students in the state. And as such, they tried to emulate their sophisticated counterparts at the Ivy League schools by forming fraternities, sororities, and clubs. Meanwhile, back east, a new athletic sport was causing a sensation at the Ivy League schools of Harvard, Princeton, and Yale. Football. First played as casual intramural games at Eastern Ivy League schools, the American version of football slowly evolved into an organized sport in the late 1860s. The game became wildly popular as people all over the nation followed the intense battles between Harvard, Princeton, and Yale for the championship pennant. It wasn't long before the game began to be played in other lesser-known universities and colleges across the country. It became popular for different reasons in different areas of the country. Um, it was much more of a strategic game in the East and uh, kind of considered almost a high-class operation with Princeton and, and those folks, but when it came out west, it became much more bohemian. And what they really liked about it was the rough and tumble, slugging, hitting, uh, brawn part of the game. And that's what developed in the west. And it's one of the reasons why it took so long for it to develop in the west, because it wasn't considered true football. It was more pugilistic in its uh, origins. It used to be you could not get a team from Illinois to come past the uh, Mississippi River to ever play anybody. Um, but that soon changed, and a lot of that was Nebraska, Nebraska and its fans. By 1883, students at the University of Nebraska called for the formation of an official school team. If a football team could be formed, we might, in the years to come, have enough college enthusiasm to designate ours as a real college, and not a gathering place for those who do not know what a live college should be. Yeah. <laughs> In the early 1880s, the student newspaper had advocated the, the creation of a football team to represent the school. I've even read accounts of, of uh, uh, playing football uh, without, a, without a ball. I, I think the university itself was still getting organized. So I think that, you know, at first there was probably fringe interest or there was interest on the part of a few students or the students who were interested weren't very organized. And that over time, you, you know, they, they made more and more noise and it was more effective and, and they made better arguments. I think the students probably figured out and the faculty and the administration all figured out that this could have some value, um, uh, both for, you know, a, as, as a healthy activity, uh, as a great spectator sport, and maybe as something that would be good for the school. Our football team has been challenged by the YMCA of Omaha. It is to be hoped that this sport will soon occupy the position it should hold in the university. However, if the University of Nebraska is going into the football business in earnest, as now seems probable, it will be necessary to properly clothe the university team. 
Canvas suits for the 11 would cost about $35. In the meantime, our new team now has a coach. Dr. Langdon Frothingham, a Harvard graduate and former player for that school, will coach our boys in preparation for their first match on Thanksgiving Day. He came from out east, and nearest that I can tell, there's his greatest contribution to the sport of uh, football in Nebraska was the heel into football. So he really was there in, in spirit, but how much he actually contributed to the, the sport, I think there's still a lot of open minds on that one. There was this movement, you know, to get a team who, who was going to coach this team? Well, Frothingham had a football, knew something about it, and actually had uh, exposure to where the game was formed in the East and in, uh, in those Ivy League schools. I think he helped organize the team, or at, at least give the rudiments of the, of the game to the, to the students to, to play the game, and actually uh, at some point scrimmaged with his students. By the end of October 1890, the newly formed University of Nebraska football team had a coach, uniforms, and an opponent for their first game. However, the one thing the new team didn't have was a name. If you look in the early days of, of reports of Nebraska football, uh, most of the nicknames that were assigned were really more for pros, for journalists who got tired of using the phrase, our boys, the team, the players. They needed something a little more flowery in the style, so they would come up with descriptive terms. There were several things that that uh, were applied as nicknames, none of which I think were actually sanctioned by the university, that the university said, okay, this is the, this is the nickname of our team. I don't, I'm not even sure that that concept existed at that time. That's probably one of those things that, that you would look back and say, how would people look at football then as, as, as they would look at it now? Yeah, there are a lot of different stories about where the name comes from, but I found really that there were two seemed to two stories seemed to kind of predominate. And one of them was that a journalist came out in the 1870s. There was a drought going on. He said that the bugs were so bad that they were devouring all the corn before it could be picked, and there was nothing left for the people of Nebraska to, to eat other than the bugs themselves. And I think the name bug eaters might have gotten started from that or that contributed to it or something. But I think there is also, there was a bird that everybody would see flying around in the, at, at dusk, chasing after bugs, you know, 50, 100 feet in the air. They're all over the place and they're night hawks. And I believe their nickname was bug eaters. You know, they dart around and grab their prey and maybe, uh, maybe it seemed like a, a good name, the bug eaters. I think if they had instead chosen the Nighthawks, Nebraska Nighthawks has a little bit more of a ring to it. I think the name might have survived, but uh, Bug Eaters, that one, uh, that was born under a bad sign. I think the initial reference was in some way derogatory. These people out on the plains, you know, they're eating bugs to survive. But the actual reference was that these are such hardy individuals, if they have to resort to eating bugs to survive, to stay there, they'll do that. That's what they're going to do. And so I think that the application of that name to the football team basically at that time, if in fact anybody ever did refer to them in print as, as bug eaters, was, was more of a positive kind of description that these are hardy individuals, these are rugged individuals, that they'll do what they have to do to survive and not be driven away. After a month of intense preparation, the University of Nebraska football team traveled to Omaha for its first game on Thanksgiving Day. The captain of the first Nebraska football team was Ebenezer Mockett. Today, his niece, Joan Kasari, remembers her great uncle's football playing days. When Uncle Eb started, they were called the Old Gold Knights. They didn't know how to play football. And they wanted to have a team because they heard that other places were having a team. He said they were all black and blue. Uh, after that game was over. I'm pretty proud of his achievements because he did get it. He and that group, you know, got it started and it was a two game season, but that's a start. 
Today marked the first game of rugby football that has been seen in Omaha, and there were several hundred people out to see the boys enjoy themselves and break each other's shins. The game was called at 3.30 o'clock, and the struggle began, resembling the old-fashioned game of log heap more than anything else. When one of the players secured the ball, he immediately proceeded to fall down, and the rest fell over him. The scene presented an animated mass of legs and arms from the midst of which the ball was rescued only to be the nucleus of another log heap. The visitors scored three safety touchdowns and just at the close of the game added four points by a clean touchdown, winning against the YMCA boys by 10 to 0. Once the game was declared over, the combatants retired to nurse their bruised chins and tried to make their hats fit the bumps which adorned their heads. As the university football team played their first game, a new tradition was born, the Nebraska football fan. You know, from the very earliest days of football in Nebraska, the fans were as much a part of the phenomenon as the football teams were. Beyond a shadow of a doubt, from the very beginning, it was the fans that made the team what it was. Was the success of the Nebraska football team what brought the fans in, or was it the admiration and excitement of the fans and support that made the team great? It's a little of both, quite honestly. They started out as a very good football team and very well supported. One of the reasons why they were so good, because the fans went to the games, agreed to pay for the, the facilities, and would travel. Back in the early days, the way the teams made money was through the gate receipts, and they would split it with the opponents. And Nebraska was a surefire team when they went to an opponent's place to bring a lot of fans with them, much the same as today. While many University of Nebraska students soon became devoted fans of football, there was only one person who could be thought of as the team's most enthusiastic fan. Roscoe Pound was a student at the time. I think he was a very high energy guy. I think uh, Roscoe's contributions has been uh, undercredited. Uh, if you really want to look at someone who really got the Nebraska football program going single-handedly. Roscoe is, is one to do that. He was very involved with the team. He was a writer. He was, uh, was involved in the student government. And one of the reasons why the university stood up and paid attention to football and its potential was because of Roscoe. A Lincoln native, Roscoe Pound not only officiated many games, he also convinced fans to wave small red flags and led the crowd in cheers. You, you, you and I! You, you, you and I! Burr, burr, versus die! Burr, burr, versus die! And he pressed by! And he pressed by! Oh my! Oh my! The second and final game of the first Nebraska football season was against Doan College in Crete. Again, the NU team would be victorious, and Nebraska ended its first football season by winning both of their games by shutouts. In fact, the only thing the Nebraska football team lost that season was its coach. Farthingham decided to leave the University of Nebraska to return to the East Coast. Today, Dr. Frothingham continues to hold the record as the only Nebraska football coach in the history of the school to never have lost a game. I think it's more of a token gesture, to be honest with you. Uh, he will he has that record, it, it's official, but um, you know, I found it very interesting when, uh, uh, not to change eras here, but when Bo Pelini came back, one of the first questions that I asked the university was, uh, before Bo's first game, what's his record as a head coach? Because he had actually coached them in the Alamo Bowl against Michigan State, but he had the interim tag at that time. Does that count towards his official records? And no one's really been sure whether it was or not. He was the head coach, but he was kind of interim, so he had kind of a little asterisk on it. And I think you probably have to put asterisks by Frothingham as well. By the fall of 1891, W.P. Bowen, a newly hired physical education instructor, was named as the new football coach. Unfortunately, he knew nothing about football, but nevertheless led the team to victory over Doan by winning the season's opening game 28 to four. Sadly, two weeks later, the two teams had a rematch, and this time Doan defeated Nebraska, giving the NU football team its first loss. The second game with the Doan College team was played at Crete on Saturday, November 14th, and the U of N died hard, but she died, and that was sufficient for Doan. Doan is to be congratulated. Her teamwork was excellent, and she well deserves her first victory over our team. What lost the game for us today, was asked us. Lack of team practice and poor luck, we answered. Perhaps it is not best to win all the time. 
Final score, Doan 14, Nebraska 12. The lack of coaching skills by W.P. Bowen put the Nebraska football team at a disadvantage, right when they needed it the most, because the next game would be its first against a major university, and would be the biggest challenge the Nebraska team had encountered yet. They were about to battle the Iowa Hawkeyes. Organized as an intramural club sport in 1872, the University of Iowa played its first officially recognized varsity game in 1889 and soon became a major team in the Midwest. In order to help the Nebraska Bug Eaters prepare for the first Nebraska-Iowa game, legend has it that the Iowa football coach, T.U. Lyman, had an idea. He would not only coach his own team, but that of his opponent as well. That's a great moment in sports history, if you ask me. You know, there's this potential budding rivalry, and it's the first time that Nebraska plays Iowa. Of course, Nebraska is concerned about its readiness to play a school that has a real team and a coach, and Nebraska really has neither. And uh, the beautiful thing is that I was equally concerned about playing a team that has no, no coach and, and no skills and no knowledge. So they very generously send their coach over to help the Nebraska team get ready for the game. I think that's a beautiful moment in football history. Iowa needs a, an opponent to play and they need people of similar talent. And Nebraska was getting there and Iowa knew that. So providing help and assistance was not wholly unusual. Iowa. Uh, was very much advanced. They had already developed the system of audibles and calling plays at the line of scrimmage, which Nebraska had never done. Uh, there was a game against Iowa where the players would line up at the beginning of the game and suddenly the Iowa quarterback started barking out letters and numbers, A, Z, right, left, and Nebraska players were standing around having no idea what was happening, what, what, he, what he was saying. And after the game, Iowa took him aside and taught him. This is what we're doing. We're changing the plays. We're talking about the plays and giving assignments. And it changed the concept for Nebraska of how to play. They understood a little differently. Uh, so it's kind of like tennis. You get better when you play tennis against somebody who's as good or better than you. Playing against somebody who's worse than you doesn't make you a better player. About 60 brazen-throated and brazen-flagged enthusiasts went up to Omaha to witness the Nebraska-Iowa game Thanksgiving Day. Nebraska was not in the score, losing to Iowa by 22 points but played well nevertheless. Very well, considering that this is the first time she has ever played an old established team. It was a much better game than the score might indicate, and the U of N has no cause to be ashamed of the score. The idea of the wedge play was to have the players who were not carrying the ball line up in a V formation and lock their arms together, looking like a one great big Red Rover, Red Rover. The ball carrier or even two players who would hide the ball between them would stand behind that wedge and they would merely mass forward and try to push everybody out of the way. Worked very effectively, uh, but it also created a lot of injuries. Uh, one of the first things that the uh, university did was ban the interlocking of arms. That was th thought to hopefully solve the problem of too many bodies, too many heads, because one of the problems is you can't protect yourself when your arms are locked against uh, your neighbor, so your face and body were exposed and the defense knew that. So they eliminated the, uh, the locking of arms, but it still didn't uh, resolve the problem. That's when you started coming up with the line of scrimmage rules and having to create the buffer zone between the two teams and the requirement the players had to line up on the line of scrimmage, it was to get rid of the wedge play. So the lineup that we see today, the line of scrimmage, came about because of the effectiveness of the wedge play. Today, historians have learned a surprising truth about T.U. Lyman and his role in coaching the first Nebraska-Iowa game. In the process of, of doing some research for some of the projects I've done, I went back and I, I looked through the list of Iowa head, University of Iowa head coaches. Well, there is no T.U. Lyman that was ever a coach at Iowa. T.U. Lyman played at Iowa College in Grinnell. He had played there and had had success against the University of Iowa in three consecutive seasons before 1891. So Lyman, who had been a player at Iowa College in Grinnell, came to Lincoln and prepared Nebraska to play at the University of Iowa. He was from Iowa College in Grinnell. He wasn't from the University of Iowa. Nebraska finished its second season by going up against Doan one last time. 
Motivated by their loss to Iowa and becoming better trained by Coach Lyman, the Bug Eaters defeated Doan by 32-0. The standout player in the final Doan game was a young freshman halfback named George Flippin, the first black football player on the Nebraska team. Flippin ran with the ball for three touchdowns in the game and would soon become a star player in the following seasons. Uh, George Flippin is a great story. I mean, partly because where did he come from? I mean, this is just, this, the, you know, they weren't recruiting anybody in those days. It was whoever happened to go to the university and happened to show up and, you know, turn out for practice and, and, and prove to be a decent player. George Flippin was a natural because he was an athlete. He held a couple of school records in track. He had won championships as a heavyweight wrestler. He was the biggest guy on the team, and he was African-American. He was the first black football player in the Midwest, one of the first three in the country. And it kind of went mostly unnoticed because, again, Nebraska has some anonymity in its area that it was, it was way out in the boondocks and the plains that nobody paid attention to. Of course, there was controversy with some folks, but it never seemed to have affected Nebraska and their players. At the end of the 1891 football season, a new Western Interstate University Football Association was formed, consisting of the universities of Iowa, Kansas, Missouri, and Nebraska. But as the 1892 season was about to begin, coaching continued to be a problem for the fledgling Nebraska football team. J.S. Williams replaced W.P. Bowen as the official coach, but Williams was frequently absent from his duties, and when he was present, failed to make an impact on the team. With scarlet and cream chosen as Nebraska's official school colors, the 1892 season began against a new opponent, the University of Illinois, another well-established college league football team that had won their state championship for the last five years. What hope would the Nebraska boys have against such a team that was even more powerful than Iowa? On October 24th, our football boys scored their first victory. And indeed, it was a victory, for we played a team that had held the state championship of Illinois for five successive years. But when they struck the rattlesnake boys of Nebraska, they were severely beaten. At three o'clock, the pigskin was started from the center with the regulation V, and 15 yards were made before it was downed in an exciting contest of wills. Flippin scored the only touchdown of the game, and the final score was Nebraska six, Illinois zero. Nebraska had surprised everyone by conquering a foe no one thought could be beat. However, as the two teams were about to leave the field, an act of violence occurred. After the Nebraska-Illinois game, but before the lines had broken, formed as they were for a scrimmage, Huff, the heavyweight of the Illinois team, struck A.B. Jones of the Nebraska team, a terrible blow in the face, knocking him flat and bringing the blood freely. The slugger then turned on his heel and laughingly walked away. As soon as the fact became known, great indignation was felt, and if it had not been for the presence of the chancellor and several professors, violence would have been done to the perpetrator. This outburst of violence would be the beginning of many problems the Nebraska team would experience during the 1892 season, mostly because of its star player, George Flippin. This was the case for their next game, in which the Nebraska team traveled to Colorado to battle the Denver Athletic Club. After we'd been beaten, we were still treated royally by the Denver Athletic Club. The evening was to be spent at the theater. Through a false sense of patronage, the manager at the Opera House got the idea into his bigoted brain, devoid of gray matter, that the patrons would not like to see a Negro in the fashionable part of the Opera House. Of course, once Mr. Flippin was debarred from attending the play, the rest of our club, myself included, refused to attend the play. Mr. Flippin is a member of our team and a student of the university. This latter fact entitles him to all the rights and privileges enjoyed by any other student. Whatever he is not allowed to attend, no other member of our team will do either. The trouble of racism against George Flippin wasn't just limited to Denver. The following week, the Nebraska team traveled south to play the University of Missouri in the first contest between the two teams. Again, there was one problem, George Flippin. It is unconceivable to us that any of them bug-eating farmers up the river would allow some colored boy to play on their team. The thought of some Negro rubbing elbows with us educated white men, it's enough to turn the stomach of any decent human being. There is no way that Nebraska colored boy will be allowed to set foot on our playing field. If Nebraska can leave their Negro at home, then we will take them on. 
If they refuse, then we will not play them on the field and damage our reputation and our code of honor. That a club from Missouri should object to playing our team because one member is colored is a significant fact. It denotes that there still exists in our Southern institutions remnants of that delusion which has so long boggled their minds. We are informed that no Negroes are admitted to the Missouri University. This is nothing more than race prejudice, influenced by secret sectional desire for revenge. Why do we find the anti-Negro sentiment so openly expressed by the Missouri football team? Those who play in their team now are only the sons of those who hated the Negro unto death. They believe what their fathers believed. If they do what their fathers did, they will have to be whipped as their fathers were whipped. Our team is truly representative, both of our principals and of our members. If the Missouri team refuses to come off from their bigoted perch, let them remain in the delightful companionship of the putty heads who are of their opinion. The game against Missouri was canceled, and Missouri's forfeit was recorded as a 1-0 victory for Nebraska. However, problems continued to plague the Nebraska football team during the remainder of the 1892 season. The Bug Eaters lost their next game against Kansas, and on Thanksgiving Day, the Nebraska team traveled to Omaha for the annual Iowa game. In Omaha, the Paxson Hotel was made our headquarters. There was the usual row over the admission of Flippin, the only colored member of our team. But we boys are bent on seeing the Civil Rights Bill is enforced, so far as hotels are concerned. And manfully, we stood up for our fellow teammate. The result was that the management yielded so far as to actually allow Flippin to eat and sleep in the hotel and pay for it. But a private dining room was given to all the boys, so the other guests might not know of the awful fact that a colored man was actually a guest at the hotel. Whatever discrimination George Flippin faced in Omaha, it didn't affect his performance on the field, and Flippin became the star player of the 1892 Nebraska-Iowa game. The struggle for supremacy between the Nebraska and Iowa State University teams wound up a tie after consuming nearly three hours, and the game is now a thing of the past. Never before were two more evenly matched, and the gains were made more often by the brilliant plays of individual members than by concentrated teamwork. Flippin was the star as usual, and he had the ball most of the time. He seemed never to grow tired, and whether he plays battering ram or sprinter, he gets the ball in the direction direction he wants it to go. Flippin carried off the laurels of the day, and at the conclusion of the game, if he had wanted the town, all he would have had to do would have been to ask for it, and it would have been given him by his admirers. The fall of 1893 brought a major change to the football program at the University of Nebraska. For the first time, the university hired a professional coach to manage the team paying him $500, part of which was given in free tuition for medical courses. The new coach was Frank Crawford, a former graduate student at Yale University. Heretofore, we have always had amateur coaches, men who had a general theoretical knowledge of football, but who lacked tact, discipline, and organization. Now, we have hired a man to take charge of the team who is capable of managing any team in the country. Mr. Crawford played for a number of years on the Yale team, where he distinguished himself for his coolness and pluck. As a coacher, he has been most successful. We consider ourselves very lucky in securing such a coach. Now, I confess I was greatly disappointed at the material that presents itself. I had expected to find plenty of large, strong men, and on the other hand, I find the lightest and youngest crowd I ever saw on a football field. In a very short time, we'll have to play some strong teams, and. I don't see how it'll be possible for us to win unless we find some heavier men for the center. In the meantime, we've been having light practice now for a week, and I'm glad to say I see great progress made, especially in the line. If Nebraska's only willing to try what I believe she's capable of doing, and if we all work with a will, reasonably and justly, we may have the right to cherish any hopes. The 1893 season began with the opening game against rival Doane College, and the Bug Eaters won by a score of 28-0. to zero. The NU team next battled Baker University, which resulted in a tie, 10-10. to 10. Then the following week, the Nebraska team traveled to Denver to play against the Denver Athletic Club. Denver won the toss and chose the west goal, having the advantage of the wind and sun. Soon, Nebraska scored a touchdown. 
By the half, the score was Nebraska 4, Denver 0. In the second half, Macon, for the Denver team, commenced the slugging. This was the beginning of sorrows. By this point, everybody slugged, but the Denver team took particular aim at Flippin, who was kicked, slugged, and jumped on, but never knocked out and gave as good as he received. Finally, the umpire gave the game to Nebraska, though the score was tied 4-4. to For many people, the violence that unexpectedly erupted during the Denver game only served to reinforce the idea that football was a savage sport. The following week, the local papers wrote editorials railing against the violent aspects of the game and published cartoons like this. The football player is not pleasant to look upon. He has not the agreeable outward seeming of the trained boxer, stripped to the waist, his nether limbs encased in tights, his body gracefully poised for attack or defense. He suffers by comparison with the baseball player, whose tasteful uniform sets off his athletic figure. He is at a disadvantage even in competition with the hump-backed bicycle rider, who is certainly not a thing of beauty. His whole appearance is against him. He looks like a bundle of old clothes, off with a window mop. His countenance is scarred and abraded, his expression stolid and forbidding, yet he's the idol of the hour, envied by young men, beloved of the maidens, and mightily approved of by the elders. I think the football program represented the state in many ways. It's a rough game, and I think that appealed to people in a plain state and agrarian situation. There's got to be something about the kind of game it is, because baseball was well entrenched, you know, by that time, and and baseball remained popular for decades and generations. But football must appeal to something else. It really came out of what made the Midwest so strong, that bohemian culture, the working with your hands. Unlike some sports like baseball, it required a lot more eye-hand coordination or special skills. You didn't need special skills to play football if you were big enough and strong enough and hit hard enough. The debacle that was the Denver game was followed by losses over the next two weeks to Missouri and Kansas. By late November, there was only one game left, the annual battle against the Iowa Hawkeyes in Omaha, Nebraska on Thanksgiving Day. Nearly 1,000 people hardy enough to brave the freezing cold were out at the Association Park at 3.15 on Thanksgiving Day when the Iowa-Nebraska University teams lined up to play the last of the series for both teams. This is the third annual match between the Bug Eaters and the Iowa Hawkeyes. And this time, the third time was the charm. Iowa, whom we have never beaten before, at last has been swiped by our plucky 11. It was not luck either. We won by superior teamwork, by better tackling, and by far better interference. The Bug Eaters did it. And now our university will be given credit for having a football team that can play football. The Nebraska-Iowa game wasn't the only big event on Thanksgiving of 1893. On the East Coast, for the first time in many years, the mighty Yale team was finally defeated by their arch-rival Princeton. Football had not only become a part of an American Thanksgiving holiday, it was now the number one sport in America, and in Nebraska, the game had become an obsession. All of Nebraska's youth were playing football, whether it was with their friends or as members of one of the state's two powerful college teams. And the obsession with football was not just limited to young men. In 1894, a young co-ed and aspiring writer named Willa Cather became the editor of the University of Nebraska student newspaper, The Hesperian. Soon afterwards, Cather increased the coverage of the football team in each issue. Apropos of football, it seems to be one of the very few thoroughly reputable and manly games left in the 19th century. It is one of the few games which offer no particular inducement to betting, and which are not conducive to strange or natural excitement. It arouses only the most simple and normal emotions. It requires strength and skill and courage, attributes which no young man can afford to be without. She was sort of like a football philosopher of her time. She traveled with all the fans that followed the team. That was a, a fabulous social experience for students, and I, I think she had lots of reasons to like it, which yeah. is sort of surprising for someone who you'd think would, would be totally, uh, you know, mental. I think Willa Cather was also very athletic. She has that the Plains mentality. That these people are hardy, you know, they'll do what they have to do to survive, and man, football is just a rough and tumble type thing, and I think that people will work hard and, and uh, 
play hard, that, that appealed to them. In 1894, Frank Crawford agreed to continue coaching the Nebraska football team, but as the Bug Eaters began practicing for their first game of the season, a serious rift developed between Coach Crawford and the players when they voted George Flippin, now a senior, as team captain. It takes a man with brains to be a captain. All there is to Flippin is brute force. I don't take exception to him because he's colored, but it takes a head to be a football captain. Flippin's not smart, he's just strong. That's why I don't want him to be the captain of our team. I think he tried to rally the team to his position. I don't think he had much success doing that. I think that was kind of taken out of context in, in Crawford's defense, that not so much against um, Flippin, but he had other people he wanted more, who thought were more suitable, more of his protégés. Maybe it had only to do with what he understood to be Flippin's leadership abilities or something, but you gotta believe that it partly had to do with his race. But you know, at the same time, he had conflicts with other players too, so, so who knows? It, it almost doesn't matter because the one thing you can be sure of is that the kind of guy that George Flippin was, it wasn't gonna, you know, it wasn't gonna put him down. Lord, give me the strength of the pioneer and the faith of his hearty soul. Provide me with courage to persevere. Make me fight till I reach my goal. Let weaklings indulge in a sheltered life where they curse when their luck goes bad. But fit me for battle with storm and strife. Give me brawn like my father's had. I want to be known as a man who wins, as a fellow with nerve and pluck, who finishes everything he begins, and as one who can whip his luck. Nebraska began the 1894 season by easily winning their first game, but then shocked their fans by losing the next two games in a row. By then, many in the state were about to write off the 1894 football team as a failure, but the following week, a miracle occurred. Nebraska beat the Omaha YMCA 36-6, and the Bug Eaters continued to win the rest of their games for the remainder of the season. The defeat of Missouri by Kansas at Kansas City on Thanksgiving Day by a score of 18-12 gives the pennant to Nebraska. In games, Nebraska and Missouri are tied, and in that case, the pennant with $200 goes to the team having the smallest number of points made against it. Nebraska has 27 adverse points and Missouri 38. Therefore, I am very happy to report that for the first time ever, our Nebraska football team has won the conference pennant. The victory against the Omaha YMCA would be the last football game George Flippin would ever play for the University of Nebraska. After leaving the university in the spring of 1895, Flippin attended medical school in Illinois. He really didn't graduate from UNL. He um, took coursework there and then went to the University of Illinois at Chicago and earned his medical degrees there. And then he came back to Nebraska and that his father helped him to set up a practice here in Stromsburg. So he didn't actually grow up here in Stromsburg. I don't think he was the first doctor here but he was the first one to build a hospital, as I understand it. And it is on this property that the hospital was first built. He had a reputation of never turning anybody down. If somebody were asking for his help, no matter how far away they were, he was going to travel and do what he could to help them. There's reports that people would be told it was like $50 for a procedure, and he would offer to do it for 25, knowing that they couldn't afford the other ones, so it was a good trait to have. People respected him for that. Today, there are only a few people alive who remember being treated by Dr. George Flippin. One of these former patients is Stromsburg resident Stanton Moore. Well, I must have been about seven, eight years old, and uh, I was riding my brother's bike, and I run into this pickup that had the lid down on the box, and I damaged this leg. And uh, I stood up and I fell down. I damaged the nerves in this leg right in here. I made a little dent in it, as a matter of fact. 
So I crawled across the road and I was crawling in the ditch and he saw me from his window in the hospital. He came down and he wanted me to stand up and walk. I wonder why I was crawling in the ditch. And I told him I was trying to hide from somebody. <laughs> he said, stand up. And I did and I fell right down. He says, okay, tell me about it. So then I told him about it. And he was a big, strong guy. He was a loving guy. He picked me up and he carried me and he took me home to my parents' house and laid me on the kitchen table. And he told them to put hot packs, soda hot packs on my leg for an hour. And after that, to get me on a bicycle and follow me and drive to Osceola and back. And if you do that, he'll be perfectly okay. If he don't, he'll have a bad leg all of his life. And we did just like he said, and that leg was just fine after I got through that. He was a good man. He was a kind man. He a lovable man. Good looking man. And he was always willing to help and do things in a good way. And I can still see him driving down the gravel road in that car of his. <laughs> Dr. Flippin would become the first person in York County to own an automobile. And after he was denied service at a local cafe because of his skin color, Dr. Flippin became the first Nebraska black man to successfully argue a civil rights case in the Nebraska State Court. He went to an opera house with his colleagues, and when they were done, they went to a restaurant in the lower part of that building, downtown York, Rio Cafe, Gutenfelder was the owner, and they walked in, they were ordering sandwiches and coffee, and the waitress told him he would have to eat it in the kitchen. And he said, I don't eat in my own kitchen. <laughs> I'm not going to eat in a restaurant's kitchen. The state of Nebraska brought suit against Gutenfelder and the Rio Cafe um, on behalf of George Flippin. And many people say it's the first racial discrimination case. Whether it is or not, I don't know, but it was probably among the first, at least. It went into county court, and George side won. George Flippin continued to live in Stromsburg until the time of his death in 1929. Even though many of that generation are gone, the story is still claimed to be the largest funeral that Stromsburg has ever seen. And Dr. George Flippin is the only black person buried at the Stromsburg Cemetery and in Polk County. By the fall of 1895, football had become a major part of collegiate life at the University of Nebraska, and the new coach, Charlie Thomas, would lead the team to a six-win and three-loss season. Then in the following year, 1896, Edward N. Robinson became coach, and under his direction, the Bug Eaters would earn six victories, suffer three defeats, and score one tie. However, near the end of the season, an unfortunate event took place in Lawrence, Kansas, during a game between Kansas and Doan that would almost end football in the state of Nebraska forever. In the football game here this afternoon between Kansas University and Doan College of Nebraska, Speak, who scored the last touchdown, was tackled by Zerf while going at a great rate of speed. Zerf was thrown backwards, hitting the back of his head on the ground, inflicting injuries which will be fatal. Zerf was injured very severely in the game between Tarkio and Doan several weeks ago, and it is thought that a clot of blood had collected in the back part of his head. He died at 11.30 tonight without regaining consciousness. The death of one of Doan College's star football players sent shockwaves through the state of Nebraska and immobilized those who had been against the sport from the beginning. is a vile sport that brings out the worst in our morally upstanding young men. This rival game turns the most innocent and Christian son into a snarling, raging beast of a man, ready to pounce on his opponent like animals in a jungle. In fact, more young American men die from playing football each year than from drinking, gambling, or fighting in brawls. Football is a sin and it must be outlawed to protect the bright young men of Nebraska. What? No more football? The thought of it is disturbing, disgusting, and it stinks. The calls for abolishing football in the state continued to grow louder. 
reaching the point that state legislator Gaffin of Saunders County introduced a bill that would entirely ban the playing of football within the state. What I found most interesting about the, the bill that when the Nebraska legislature uh, was considering banning the sport was not only did they want to penalize anybody who played the sport, you could be fined for watching the sport. And in addition, if you saw somebody watching football and you turned them in, then you would get a portion of the fine. So they created a tattletale system, a snitch system, in place that we could have folks go to the local constable and say there's a football game breaking out and take them out there and arrest them and then he would collect a reward for doing that. So turning player against player or student against student was their hope of trying to really crush it. Didn't happen. The 1897 Nebraska football season began with a humiliating defeat to Iowa State. However, the Bug Eaters rebounded and surprised everyone by winning their next three games in a row. Then the following week, it was time for Nebraska to face the strongest team of the conference, the mighty Kansas Jayhawks. The game began at three o'clock and with a vigor that seemed to promise a splendid contest. Nebraska hit the line for steady gains and carried the ball up the field at a lively rate. In the second half, Williams and Benedict made gains. Calgill punted the ball over the line. Then there was a dispute that lasted until darkness settled down on the field and the game was called. The referee gave the score as 10 to five at the end of the game, but the Jayhawks coach wouldn't accept it. The game is seen today was such an exhibition as I never hope to see again while I live. It was entirely devoid of all sportsmanlike qualities. In fact, this was no game at all as it was not finished. The game was not played to its conclusion, therefore I do not consider it any game played. And if there was any money bet on the results, I think it should be returned. I have been asked to say this by some of those who had money up on the game. However, I do offer to replay the game tomorrow in Omaha, as I yet claim my Kansas men are superior to the Nebraskans and can defeat the Bug Eaters by 30 points. Today's decisive victory for Nebraska demonstrates what I believed from the beginning, that the Nebraska team was the better of the two, despite the many claims made for Kansas. The style of game played by Kansas proved very easy to block. Kansas was evidently overconfident and do not seem to realize they were fairly beaten. Instead of acknowledging their defeat, they have endeavored to solve their feelings and let their backers down easy by claiming it was no game on a technicality that cannot stand. There's no need to replay the game. We are the victors, fair and square. Little would have been said about a protest by Kansas and a demand to replay the game on Monday had it not been for the heavy bets at big odds made by the fellows accompanying the Jayhawk aggregation. Their money was hung up, they wanted to save it, they were sore, they came here with bulging purses and vain boastings, the hotel clerks had their money and they wanted it back. And so, the beefing and squabbling occurred. As the 1898 football season approached, the Nebraska Bug Eaters were once again without a head coach. Who would the school be able to hire to lead the football team to another victorious season? Well, Fielding Yost obviously made, is in the college football of fame. He, he, he got their coaching at, at the University of Michigan. I mean, he, he, uh, he was a young guy when he came to Nebraska, had success here. But it's one of those coaches, if you look at it and say, what coaches are in the College Football Hall of Fame that coached at Nebraska? Fielding Yost is one of those guys. He was a very popular coach, brought a lot of knowledge and brought a lot of respect. He was very well known in the sport. And when he came to Nebraska, the perception that people had of the Nebraska football program changed overnight because if it was good enough for Yost, it was good enough for them. Under the direction of Fielding Yost, the Nebraska Bug Eaters began their 1898 football season by defeating Hastings College by the amazing score of 76 to zero. And in the following weeks, the Bug Eaters easily won their next four games. But soon it was time for Nebraska to face a rematch against their arch rival, Kansas. 
The Nebraska Bug Eaters traveled by train down to Lawrence, Kansas to undertake the mighty KU Jayhawks. Once more, the long-haired heroes of Kansas and Nebraska have met and a winning score of 18-6 for NU sends a thrill of joy to the heart of every loyal son and daughter of the old university. Towards the end of the second half, referee Foltz called the game on account of darkness, although three minutes yet remained. Final score, Nebraska 18, Kansas 4. Nebraska may have a new coach, but they haven't changed their ways in illegally winning games against my Jayhawk team. The game was not played out in its entirety since the referee called it with three minutes still remaining. Therefore, when the question comes up of whether there was a game or not, in my opinion, there was none played. And if you reporters are to do your job correctly, then no loss for us or victory for Nebraska can be recorded in the books. The only solution to what happened today is for Nebraska and us to replay the game and done right. The 1898 Nebraska-Kansas game was never replayed, and by the end of the season, the Bug Eaters won eight games and lost three, enabling the Nebraska team to win the conference pennant for the second year in a row. However, although the 1898 football team had triumphed on the gridiron, the sport was almost eliminated from the university in April of 1899. A mass meeting was held in the chapel Wednesday morning to take action on athletic matters. Financial Secretary Max Westerman has advised that athletics be dropped entirely from the university if the remaining debt of $250 cannot be raised at once. If the association cannot pay its past debts, there is no use of incurring new ones. In all, a total of $210 was either collected or pledged, leaving still a deficit of about $40. Through the donations of the faculty, staff, and students, the football team and other athletic programs were saved but the team still lost their winning coach. Since he was not guaranteed a job for the following season, Fielding Yost accepted the position as head football coach at Nebraska's rival, Kansas. In the future, Fielding Yost would become one of the most successful coaches in football history at the University of Michigan. And I often wonder what the University of Michigan would be like if Yost had never come, uh, and how what Nebraska might be like uh, had he stayed. Of course, Nebraska was able to bring in some other great coaches uh, shortly after him. But I think a lot of the reasons why uh, Nebraska did was because Yost came in and gave it the blessing. And people now understood that this was a serious program to be dealt with. As the fall of 1899 approached, once again, the Nebraska football team was left without a coach. Who would the university be able to hire to replace Fielding Yost and lead the team to victory? Hey, Edwin Branch, captain of his team at Williams College last year, is the man that was hired by the members of the athletic board to coach the team this fall. His recommendations state that he is aggressive in play, strict in observation of training rules, and off the field, one of the most perfect gentlemen on campus. Whatever his strengths and abilities, A. Edwin Branch was not a capable coach, and the 1899 Nebraska football team would only be remembered for losing the most games in a single season since the first team was formed in 1890. Because of this, Coach Branch was not asked to return for the 1900 football season, and he went back to the East Coast. Consequently, the person selected to become the new coach of the Nebraska Bug Eaters had to find a way to bring the team back to winning games and the conference pennant. And in Walter Cowles Booth, nicknamed Bummy, the university found just the man the team needed to win. There are a good many conditions necessary to turn out a winning football team. And at this early date in the season, it's impossible to say how many of them will be present at our university this fall. We must have material, we must have harmony, and we ought to have a hundred other things, but a willingness to work, that covers the multitude of football deficiencies. And this is the point that needs to be emphasized. There's just only 11 spots on the team, but we need substitutes, a good quota to draw the second 11. And everybody who has any football ability, or those who want to figure out if they have what it takes, I urge you to try out for the team with a determination to stick this season out. Bommy brought a 
almost a military style to the school, to the training. He liked things very regimented and uh, controlled. He was uh, very much an authoritarian. I don't know that you really call him a player's coach. He was in charge and he liked it that way and uh, he was successful at it. During his stretch, until you get to Jumbo Steve, Bummy Booth's teams kind of define the success that Nebraska fans have equated with tradition. I think that's interesting. Some Nebraska fans will look at it and say, well, the tradition, the success began when Bob Devaney came here in 1962 because Nebraska had that dramatic success immediately under Bob Devaney. Well, you go back to Bummy Booth, it doesn't get much better than that. Under Booth's direction, the Nebraska Bug Eaters roared back to life as Booth incorporated many new techniques and strategies to craft a winning team. However, as the 1900 football season was about to begin, Cy Sherman, a young sports writer for the Lincoln Star newspaper, decided it was time for a change. The name Bug Eaters is inappropriate for a team as mighty as our University 11. No, it's time for a new nickname for our boys, and the name should be Cornhuskers, not Bug Eaters. Our team does not eat bugs. It detassels our opponents limb by limb. Cornhuskers is what they are, and Cornhuskers is all that I'll be calling them from now on. The first use of Cornhuskers actually was a derogatory term towards the University of Iowa. When we beat them, an anonymous writer said that we have met the Cornhuskers and they are ours. So Cy saw that and thought, okay, if we're gonna be, have a derogatory term, maybe bug eaters isn't the one we want, let's go and take a look at Cornhuskers. So he just started calling him that. The first thing was Sherman giving the nickname to the football team, then the student yearbook became the Cornhusker, and then 1947, the state becomes the Cornhusker state. So it's fairly significant what he, what he did. The Nebraska football team, rechristened the Cornhuskers, won six of its eight games in the 1900 season. And in the following year, 1901, Coach Bummy Booth led the team on a 24-game winning streak that would last until 1904. A decade after their first game in 1890, the glory days of Nebraska football were about to begin. Do you think there's anything today's football players could learn from those early 1890s football players? Um, well, I think they could learn to treat football more as a, as a game of personal discovery and, and maybe a little less as a meal ticket, you know, a, 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 a potential way into the NFL. You know, I think a student ap approach to life is, is not supposed to be about you know, endorsements and, and becoming a superstar. It's supposed to be about learning, not just book learning, but learning about life and about the kind of person you want to be. They did a pretty good job of it back then and, and they could probably, we could learn something from that now. One of the reasons why I love college football history is that when you look at sports in general, baseball, football, hockey, basketball, when you think back to the history and the origins of baseball, it's rooted in professional sports. You think back into hockey and basketball, any of the history that anyone talks about, it's always about the professional. But when you talk about the history of football, its history is in the colleges, in the amateur ranks. The NFL itself is a fairly new phenomenon. College football was what it was about. That's the history of football. And to me, that's the beauty of college football and football in, as a whole. <laughs>